we're here with Bill Higgins, who's been a an important force behind the scenes in helping remote viewing and other ESP kind of uh, efforts move along. And so I wanted to get into what he's been doing in the background to help uh, all of us out in the foreground. He's not one to blow his own horn, um, so I thought I would do a little horn blowing for him. Um, but before we do that, before we get into you, Bill, and before we get into your experience with remote viewing and ESP in general, that kind of stuff, um, I want to actually uh, get some context about your life, right? So uh, now I know you uh, you spent a lot of time in New Jersey. Is that where you're originally from? Is that where you grew up? I was born in New Rochelle, New York, and grew up in New Jersey, Hillsdale, Bergen County. Okay, cool. And and I know that you're a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy. So how did that happen that you ended up at the academy? Well, when I graduated from high school, I played football, was captain of my football team, president of my class, and I had a cousin at the Naval Academy who was all state in New Jersey football. Mm -hmm. So I figured I'd give it a shot. I actually got selected for the Air Force Academy, but I had to go to a year of prep school. So I said, the hell with that, I'll go in the Navy. <laughs> we we won't let the Navy know that that the Air Force had first dibs. <laughs> but I had applied to local schools, Ivy League, but the Naval Academy was attractive. Mm -hmm. so I said yes. Okay. And so you graduated from the Na from the academy, um, and uh, and from that point you had a active duty Navy career, uh, and then you went on to the reserves. We'll talk about reserves later, but but just briefly, what was your Navy career like? What did you do? Really hard job. I coached football and boxing at the Naval Academy for the first six months, and then I went to supply school down in Athens, Georgia, learned how to be a supply officer, got sent back to the academy. Oh, no, I went to a ship for six months. For a year, actually a year, U.S. LSD 21 Fort Mandon. Okay, cool. Fell down the ladder and hurt my knee. Oh. I hurt my knee playing football in the Navy and had, uh, had two knee surgeries. That restricted me to going to limited duty and rather than going Navy line and flying. I actually wanted to be a pilot. But jumping out of a plane would be bad. Uh -huh. Dang it. So uh, how many years active duty? Is it four, I think, you have to put in after the academy? or My first half a year was coaching football and boxing. Yeah. Then I went to supply school down in Athens, Georgia, and I went to the Fort Mandan. Yeah. Hurt my knee on the board of the ship. Ah. Got sent back to the Naval Academy in the supply department. I was just a mess officer. Officer inspecting uniforms. <laughs> what a combination really <laughs> football and boxing and then you got out um where uh what what was the next step in your life i went to the fbi spent three years in fbi in cincinnati cleveland newark and well, any uh what were your what were your most interesting uh experiences i guess the word at, with the fbi well, I did general criminal, fugitive work, chasing people down. I had 35 arrests my first year in the Bureau on a million dollars in recoveries. Then I got involved with white collar organized crime. And as I say in the FBI, that's where I had my Waterloo. This is 1975, 74. I was told to stop an investigation in a white collar organized crime guy who was heavily connected to the German Republican Party in Cleveland. And I said, fuck you. Yeah, we'll have to edit that out, Bill. I <laughs> <laughs> want to keep this family friendly, so. <laughs> I continued my investigation, and the bureau said, Higgins, we told you not to do this anymore. And this guy is bankrupting one company a month. I'm sorry, what? He was bankrupting a company a month. Oh. He was a scam operator, hmm. and he was making millions of dollars. So I decided to investigate anyway. And then I ended up getting my head kicked in. And I don't have a memory of how it happened. 
All I know is with a fellow agent over his house. The next thing I wake up, in my, I'm home in my bed on the way to the hospital when a fractured zygoma blow all over my left eye. And nobody telling me, Bipkis, what happened? I had surgery, had to recover. And when I leave from the bureau, again, not thinking that there was any f- criminal activity involved in the bureau, but very suspicious. Not, nobody giving any answers as what happened. I wanted to wreck my car in the process. Mm-hmm. So I was a little pissed. Say the least. Okay. Well, where did, what did you do after the after the bureau then? I went back to work with my real estate company, my family's business in New Jersey, and I went back in the Navy on full time ba- uh, naval reserves. Okay. And Desert Storm came along in '91. I volunteered for active duty, and was sent back as a deputy chief of staff for the Navy's logistics operations in the Middle East. Mm-hmm. I was a captain by this time. And what, what some listeners won't realize is that a Navy captain is the equivalent of an Army colonel. So you were pretty high up in the ranks. Right. I had a whole supply operations in the Mideast under my purview for all the forward logistics sites, Agadi, Egypt, and uh, all 116 logistics ships, Navy supply ships and Navy ships. I had a pretty decent job, and I had a big staff. And we were in Bahrain, which was kind of calm. wasn't anybody shooting anybody. It was a very interesting experience. Mm -hmm. Sounds like it. So there's one other event in your Navy career that uh, I'm aware of that I think is interesting. So do you want to tell us what you did with all those Army tanks? Oh, (laughs) I I went back in the Naval Reserve. Norfolk, someone came across my desk about 3,000 excess Army battle tank, M60 battle tanks. Something prompted my thought, iron makes good artificial reefs. So I said to the Navy, let's turn these 3,000 Army tanks into artificial reefs. And I contacted the state of Florida, and they they said they would take them all yesterday. (laughs) And they said it would generate about $5 billion in revenues for the state of Florida. So we ended up using the, the Army Material Command, transporting the tanks from Anderson, Alabama, to the Gulf of Mexico, the state of Florida, all on the coast. We sank tanks. It was the largest artificial reef program in the history of the United States, in the history of the world. And so what they did, I guess, was provide fish habitat and, and places for divers to explore. Exactly. Now, I did have an interesting experience. I dove on one of the tanks. We were sinking them in off of uh, Alabama. And as you would know, it, I got the bends. Oh, yeah. And to explain to folks who might be listening, bends is where you get excess nitrogen buildup in your blood if you've been too deep in the water and come up too fast. That's what happened. Mm-hmm. All the lessons in the world I took about diving, I didn't come up slow enough. Mm-hmm. So I slowed my diving career down for quite a bit. Yeah. Well, it's very dangerous and very painful. So uh, that must not have been a particularly good experience for you. Well, at the time I flew back to Washington, not knowing I had the bends, and that was painful. Mm. All your joints start to hurt as you get nitrogen blood vessels, nitrogen Mm -hmm. air bubbles in your blood. That was an experience that told me not to take too lightly the idea of diving well if you don't do it right it can be dangerous of course uh like a lot of things <laughs> so all right um and now you're uh you're living in new york um well i guess uh, you continued the real estate career during that time right i got involved with princeton engineering anomaly research lab down at princeton university yeah let me put you on pause for a minute because i'd like to well, th- that's kind of your first encounter, right? Uh, one of my questions was going to be, when did you, as far as you recall, when did you first hear the words remote viewing and learn about it, and and how did you feel about it at the time? Well, at the Academy, we had to do a senior pe- paper, and I wanted to do it on ESP only because I was fascinated by it. Huh. One of the distinctions of the Naval Academy was I had a perfect record in conduct. I was one of 15 in the history of the Naval Academy since 1845 to graduate without a demerit. And I used to think it was just luck. 
But I decided to do a paper on ESP, and the academy said, no, thanks. <laughs> so I did one in hypnosis and learned that about the power of suggestion. Very powerful. But I matriculated from hypnosis to, I was avid in science fiction. I forget exactly where I got the idea of remote viewing, but that tied in with ESP, extrasensory perception. And this uh, would have been what, in the 70s that you're talking about? I graduated from the academy in 66. Oh, okay. So I spent four years out on active duty and went back in the reserve. So uh, you were, it turns out you were interested in ESP even that early in your life. Uh, and I guess you read a lot of science fiction that involved it and that kind of thing. Absolutely. Mm hmm. Okay. So, so you're not, uh, are you, uh, do you, you don't recall when you first heard about remote viewing? It's probably in there somewhere. I remember I was over in England and I went by this cycle society over there. They had, and I found a location of a guy called Ingo Swan, who was back in New York. Mm -hmm. So when I got back to New York, I called him up and we got together in the Bowery on Third Street. And he was a fascinating guy. The house was cluttered like crazy. But he was very open with me, and we talked about it. I didn't realize the remote viewing was classified way above top secret. Mm -hmm. We had an open conversation of it, and I figured I'd try it. So I did. And my wife is pretty psychic. So one day up in Pauly, New York, where we have a house and we use it for the weekend, we tried to experiment. It's kind of a bitch. It really worked. Can you tell us about that experiment? What was the target? What was the, the goal? I asked my wife to put some things in the table outside in the, in the living room. And uh, she did. And I just, I described what they were. Hmm. And then I tried my wife on it. I put a block of wood on the table. It's going to be easy to see a block of wood. But out comes a hook. And she drew the picture on the piece of paper. But looking closely at the block of wood, there's a hook on the block of wood. It's the same exact size as the hook she drew. And holy shit. This stuff really works. That's that's cool. What was your uh, relationship with Ingo Swan after that? Uh, I presume you guys got together every now and again. And we'd have lunch together once a week or so. I'd go down to the Bowery and we'd go to the diner next to his house. Mm -hmm. And he would say, I'm not training you, but I'm going to bullshit with you. And I became fascinated with the subject. Somewhere or other, I got involved. Well, first off, this was all happening before the remote viewing program was declassified. Is that correct? That's right. Hmm. That was 95. It was classified. Yeah. I started in 89. You, start, you started, uh, you met Ingo in 89? Yeah. Okay. He wasn't big on top secret stuff. <laughs> well, he probably didn't actually tell you the government was doing it, did he? Well, I met Ed Dames. I met Lim Buchanan. I met uh, most of the Stargate people before I knew uh, it was classified. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry I interrupted you. You were starting to tell me something. Uh, I, I think it might have been your... Uh, connection with Pear Lab. Somehow or other, I got involved with Pear Lab, Princeton Engineering Anomaly Research Lab down in Princeton, New Jersey. And Dr. Robert John and Brenda Dunn were the head ups, uh, ran that thing. And I met Angela Thompson, Dean Radden, Roger Nelson, and they would do experiments. And I participated in this. Mm -hmm. One of the things I found fascinating was the field rig where your mind can influence the outcome of a random number generator. Mm -hmm. And I was pretty, pretty proficient in that. And I remember doing an experiment with Princeton. I was in Taiwan. They gave me some coordinates. Angela and Thompson gave me some coordinates to check out when I was over there. And I did. And I drew a very detailed picture of what was involved and put down some very detailed descriptors. And we had done five experiments. When I got back to Princeton, I checked, and I had four of them really accurate. But the fifth, nobody recognized. 42 days later, 
I get a call from Princeton saying, Bill, we're having an SSC conference, Society of Scientific Exploration Conference at Princeton. You want to come on down? I said, sure, I'll be there tomorrow. And I arrived and I had a major deja vu. And I had very copious notes. And shit, I had seen exactly where I was, was 42 days earlier. Wow. The location of Angel Thompson was sitting, the color of the tie Bob John had on. You go to the visuals and the descriptors of what they were looking like. I just blew my mind. I never had such an accurate remote view in my life. Still get the fact that it was 42 days of the future. Mm-hmm. So at that point, I was convinced that remote viewing had something to it. Marty Rosenblatt was from social remote viewing, and that was where you'd pick a picture with an X to Y decision and the way the stock would go. That made me twenty thousand dollars in the space of a couple of months. How many? How many thousand dollars? Twenty thousand. <laughs> twenty thousand. We'll, we'll we'll get the air over here shortly, but um, so you become uh, connected with the the Pear Lab, uh, and uh, and of course they they researched uh, both ESP and psychokinesis for twenty uh, some odd years at Princeton University. Yes, they did. Yeah, and um, the, unfortunately, well, they they retired from that. I think in two thousand. I want to say 2000, I don't know, about 10 years ago, I think, <laughs> something like that. Um, and uh, and Bob John has since passed away. He was, of course, a very important uh, uh, person at, at, uh, at the uh, Princeton University. And uh, Brenda's still continuing uh, their legacy. So uh, I, I gather you're probably still connected with them, with, with Brenda anyway. I haven't talked to Brendan in about a couple of years. Well, you've uh, um, you did a lot of work at with Pear, um, in as much as you, of course you could fit in with everything else you had going on. Um, what other things did you get involved with there? Well, it's mainly the remote viewing and the and the uh, field reg. Mm-hmm. I was very successful. The one of the things I found fascinating was I was in the car driving to Princeton and I was operating the field reg experiment. When I got back to Princeton, I was amazed how accurate I'd been in influencing the outcome of the field reg. Hmm. I found that geographical dis- distance and geographical location had no relevant bearing on what effect you had on the effect of the field reg. Which means that the the uh, whatever the phenomenon is, it's independent of space and time uh, in some way. Yeah. So um, I know... Uh, but, well, actually, before we um, get too far away from your experiences with Ingo Swan, any particularly interesting stories uh, that you can tell us about your interactions with him? Well, Ingo was a fascinating guy. He would constantly tell me, I'm not going to train you, Higgins. Mm-hmm. But he did. <laughs> Everything he said was a training lesson. And yeah. I was fascinated by his ability to see things and his ability to get me to see things. I can't even remember any specific experiments. This is going back almost 30 years. But it was a great loss to have him die on us. In fact, you and I both attended his funeral. We did. Uh, yeah. The, in fact, uh, you were gracious enough to let me stay in your Fifth Avenue apartment uh, at the time. And I, uh, I much appreciated that. Uh, but it was a good it was a good event. We had, of course, the. Uh, I won't say everybody that was close or important to Ingo was there because some folks couldn't make it, but as many as could who had some connection with Ingo were present, and and it was really great. It was almost like a family reunion of people who weren't necessarily family, but they did have Ingo Swan in common, and, and it was great. Yeah, he was a fascinating guy. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we're let's go back to Pear and whatever happened. Beyond that, what else? What else did you have going on with them? And well, spent a lot of time with John Valentino. Mm-hmm. He incorporated Cyleron, which I became a heavy investor in. Yeah, Cyleron was it, the company you mentioned. Field Reg, so that's the word field, and then REG. REG stands for Random Event Generator. Um, and so maybe, uh, and, and Cyleron went into business to actually try and commercialize that. 
uh, that technology. And so what, what can you tell us about that? Well, I lost contact with John after oh, about five years ago, mm-hmm. but he had developed a way of having a light change color with the intention. You just think of red and then turn red, turn and think of blue, it would turn blue and think of green and turn green, which is pretty fascinating. Mm-hmm. I think we made some money on it, but I don't think a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, th- of course, they did other stuff, too. They had a, a portable REG, random event generator, that you could actually uh, test to see if you had some intentional influence over. I used it, actually, in my remote viewing training with, with students and in some experiments where I'd have the the random event generator running in the background, and then we would do a remote viewing uh, experiment, and then we'd check the generator to see if our uh, our consciousness is interacting during this this remote viewing session had affected it. The, the, the way that works, of course, for those who might be listening, um, the REG has a readout on it, and the and the goal is to try and make it go from random to actually non-random. And there's a graph that shows you when you go beyond random randomicity to actual uh, intentional interaction with the machine. And, uh, and we had quite a bit of success with that. Uh, during remote viewing sessions, you'd see the on the on the graph that you then got a record of, you'd see how it would go from uh, from just random behavior to becoming a, and I can't think of the word they used at uh, at the moment, but it become a a consistent, non-random sort of an indicator. And uh, it was really quite interesting. Exactly what we could do with that, I don't know, except that it shows that there's this non-local connection uh, that it can be demonstrated in a there on in with a machine that was normally uh, random. Anyway. Well, tying in my research with hypnosis back at the Naval Academy Mm -hmm. my senior year and linking it with random number generator, I found that you could evaluate the mood of a crowd by the events indicated on the random number generator. Mm. And the power of suggestion could change the outcome. Actually, this is a good idea to do with Facebook. (laughs) How, How would you see that happening? Put a fuel rig in the room uh, uh-huh. and see what influence it has. Interesting. I was just thinking about what we were talking about. Mm-hmm. That was the first indication of influencing people just by intention. Mm-hmm. Very much like sublineal hypnosis, where you can do certain things and make people suggestible. Mm-hmm. I'll end up doing it. Except this would be a, a form of suggestion that has no apparent physical connection between people. Well, when somebody watches Facebook, there's no connection there except Facebook. Right. That's what I mean. Yeah. I just thought about that. That would be an interesting concept. Let's see what we could do with it, huh? Okay. So you were you were uh, an important person behind Cideron. And I, I guess, um, I think they've now gone out of business. I, I think the idea didn't catch on with the general public, maybe because it was uh, too hard for them to get behind. Now, oftentimes, people, if they don't understand something, they don't uh, really pursue it. Uh, Valentino, I guess, has gone on into the investment world. He's quite a, he's become quite uh, significant out there. Um, so, um, one of the uh, one of your experiences involved precognition, where you actually perceived the meeting you're going to go. Uh, find yourself in 42 days later, but had no idea you were going to be there, yet you're able to actually perceive it and describe it. So um, that is, I think, sparked an interest in precognition ever since, has it not with you? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. What do you think about precognition? What do you think is going on? Well, the thing that I couldn't understand is how I could see something exactly as accurate as I did four or two days in the future when I didn't even know when I was looking at it. Mm-hmm. And I had written copious notes on and kept them. And it's always amazed me how accurate I was. Mm-hmm. The thing was interesting more, Angela Thompson was sitting right next to me. And I in, the, in the meeting, Angela was sitting next to you in the meeting. 
and I had written her name down as T O M S U M. Ah. Uh-huh. Not knowing Angel Thompson for Adam, I said, "How the hell do I do this?" It was really weird. And and what what are your thoughts today? What this is about twenty years later, I mean, yeah, it's about maybe a little more than twenty years later uh, from when that happened. What are your thoughts today about about precognition, how it may work? Well, I think time is irrelevant. It's very it's amorphous and it can be changed and inter- intercepted anytime you want to try it. Mm-hmm. Now, with the fact that the fuel reg indicated you could change the outcome of a random event, life is very indeterminate. Mm-hmm. So intentionality runs the program. You can tend things to happen, and they'll happen. Maybe it's not as concrete as that is, I'm saying, but certain intentions can affect the outcome of random events, which is life. So predetermined outcomes can be established by intentionality. Mm-hmm. Now, how effective it is, I don't think you can move the stock market, but you certainly can evaluate where the stock market's going. Mm-hmm. Until I had some medications taking for some stuff I was doing, I was doing pretty accurately. But what happens is your mind can see both pictures and right back to where you were with no decision as to what's the best one. <laughs> so you're talking about a social remote viewing here now, and, and what you're suggesting is that, for want of a better term, you're being psychic and trying to trying to determine which image you're going to be shown, which corresponds to a future event, right? And that's people who don't know what ARV is, or that's going to confuse them. But uh, I'll put a link uh, here somewhere uh, so that they can find out what it is. But what you're suggesting is, your mind can actually see both images, and if that's the case, then you're you're back to square one because you you can't predict an event that you can't get a, a specific uh, prediction out of, right? So that's where I started losing money. Yeah, <laughs> we call that displacement in ARV, where you see both targets and uh, in, in your head, and and yeah, you you do start losing money then. That's yeah. just in master. See again. I said discipline I didn't master. How did it eliminate displacement? Yeah, that's that's a problem that we haven't solved yet in 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 this in this world uh, in in this particular domain. So, um, so all that has to do with uh, ARV, and I know you've been very much involved in that for quite a while. You go to all of uh, Marty Rosenblatt's uh, conferences that you can attend, and and uh, and you're really quite a supporter of all of that. Uh, so I guess you probably not only do you want to help help the, the field out, I think you probably enjoy those things, too. Uh, they're very successful. I enjoy them a lot. Yeah, and I, I remember you being uh, so. So one of the premier remote viewers in the world today is Joe McMonigle, who was one of my colleagues at, at Fort Meade at the uh, in the military remote viewing program. And uh, you've been associated with him and followed him uh, in his career for quite a while. Um, but what can you tell us about Joe? I met him at the Ryan Research Center it was Ed May years ago. I was down there at, for some function that was totally in, not involved with Ryan. But I decided to attend some of their meetings and got hooked on uh, everything that was going on there. Mm-hmm. And Sally Fields became a dear friend. And I was very supportive of their efforts in this whole area. I haven't been back there in about two years, three years. So, so Bill, I have to, I have to uh, make a little joke here. You, you'd actually said Sally Fields, who, um, when you actually met Sally Ryan Feather, but oh, uh, yes, <laughs> yeah, but you know that's an interesting uh, mistake to make. Isn't it? <laughs> so, <laughs> no, you're right. I did say that. Yeah. I do that kind of thing all the time these days. It's getting bad. Yeah. <laughs> well, you are like older than dirt, aren't you? I mean, like you're like 120 or something. <laughs> 77. Okay. <laughs> and I know uh, you've had some health challenges lately, uh, and which has kind of slowed you down a bit. And and sorry, uh, sorry that's the case. But I did really enjoy seeing you at the remote viewing conference last month. That was uh, that was great. Yeah, I got Parkinson's disease about three years ago, mm-hmm. which is a pain in the ass. I have yeah. to walk around. 
So I'm not, I'm working out every day, but I'm not doing as much running as I used to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you're still going strong despite all that. And, and uh, I, I really admire you for that. So you got connected with Ryan. You've had, you actually are uh, behind the scenes in a number of organizations. Uh, you you want to tell us about that? Well, I got Ryan, I got Pear, I got uh, Irva. I've been involved with Irva for how many, I don't know how many years. For like forever. You've been... I've been treasurer for 10 years. Say again? I've been treasurer of Irva for about 10 years. Uh, for, of Irva for 10 years. Yeah, you're so, you're actually on the board, a, a member of the board for Ryan and Irva, and probably you were for Pear for a while, I'm guessing. I did a lot of fundraising for them. Yeah, you've been one of the forces behind the scene that keeps these organizations going uh, to a great extent. And I know folks appreciate your role there, even though most 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 people in public have no idea that you're engaged behind the scenes like that. And uh, and it's an important role to play. I've enjoyed it. Yeah. So. Um, Oh, I know what I tell you. When I was in the FBI, I used it. I before I really knew anything about remote viewing, I was an FBI agent, and one experience saved my life one time. Mm. I was about to open a door. I was looking for a fugitive, and I had this tremendous pain in my stomach, what they commonly call the gut feeling. And I grabbed this woman that was there and put her in front of me and opened the door. But lying stark naked on the bed was this fugitive I was looking for had a cock 45 automatic in his hand. Well, this is saying nobody shot each other. So you put the woman in front of you so that he wouldn't, uh, he'd recognize her and not think she was an agent so that then you could prevent some, some, some major violence from happening. Is that the scenario? That's right. I intuitively knew that this woman was a girlfriend and it would not be anybody shooting anybody mm -hmm. her. It would give me the split second to get the gun, get the gun away from this guy. So you you feel like that was a, an instance of ESP uh, being applied in your life? Absolutely. Because why would I have a stomachache right beside to open the door? Interesting. Um, did, did you have any other instances of ESP before you uh, became aware of remote viewing? Any of that you think? And you're like as a as a as a kid or a young adult or anything? Well, Naval Academy, without getting the mirror, and I I knew when trouble was about to hit. <laughs> I would avoid it. Yeah. So that was one of the most classified secrets I ever had. The fact that I had no demerits. <laughs> Yeah, I guess in a setting like that, uh, in fact, you probably didn't even want the uh, the cadre to know that you didn't have any demeanor or be, at least be aware of that because then they'd try and figure out ways of, of giving you some demerits. No, believe me, I didn't discuss it with anybody. Yeah. And when the, when the final graduation came, I went to the commandant's office and I said, what do you get going to this place without a demerit? That's easy. We put you on report. <laughs> Which gives you a demerit, right? <laughs> exactly. I said, no, guys, it's over. Mm -hmm. So I got a letter in combination with the commandant, who ended up being the second of the 15. The second of the 15? He also made it through the academy of demerit. Oh, I see. They made a big deal about it. <laughs> that was pretty funny. It okay. Was this time. Say again? It was a very tense time not getting tagged. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. I only had to wear a little speck of lint on your uniform and you'd be dead. Yeah. Was and you managed to avoid even the lint. That's pretty impressive. Uh, I remembered what I was going to ask you. Um, and, and it had to do with Joe McMonagle. I started talking about Joe and then I forgot what I want, the connection I wanted to make. So um, You've had a number of experiences with Joe, including uh, one at, in one of the uh, ARV conferences where where uh, where he actually lost you some money, right? Yes, he did. I bet on him and he was wrong. You want to tell us that story? I can't remember it. I forgot it. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, you just don't want to get crosswise with Joe. <laughs> no, he's a very nice guy. Yeah, everybody likes him. 
Okay. Well, um, is there anything else you want to tell us? Um, there's probably something I should have asked you. I didn't remember, but. Uh... Oh, thanks, Paul. I appreciate being asked these questions. It's an interesting field. I wish I knew more about it. But when you do it and it comes out right, you say, what the fuck? Yeah. Excuse my language. <laughs> but it's like, how could that be? I should ask, what does your wife think about all this? Um, you know, she, uh, you have that little experiment with her and she was successful. Uh, what does she think about your involvement now? Oh, she doesn't even talk about it. She just does it. Yeah. <laughs> she can look at a person and tell you everything about them. She's remarkable in that way. I have to be very careful. Can't try to fool my wife on anything. Well, she's, of course, a person of quite a bit of influence in her own life. Um, uh, a lot of folks probably don't realize that you're married to Barbara Corcoran, who uh, is, of course, a, a very successful New York real estate developer and one of the sharks on Shark Tank. And uh, and uh, I can imagine that she probably her her innate talents, whether she uh, does it overtly or not, has probably contributed to her success in, in the field. I contribute. I, I, I attribute everything to a successful with to her. Yeah. Uh, she's amazing. We used to go to these conferences down with uh, an organization called RELO in real estate. And she would have card reading parties and she read tarot cards for everybody. Oh, wow. <laughs> and one, one conference, she had the people lined up to get a card, cards read. Mm -hmm. no, she just looks at the cards and tells you everything about the person. Huh. Does she do that? Still do that at all, or is that all the time? Huh. No, she's a practical application of ESP. Mm -hmm. She doesn't admit it. She just doesn't. And I think that most of the success in business is because of her ability to read people. In fact, when she makes decisions on buying things in Shark Tank, mm -hmm. the PLs don't make a thing. Profit and loss statements don't mean anything. It's the reading of the person that makes her decide whether she wants to go with this deal or not. Mm -hmm. And she's pretty accurate. And very successful. That's interesting. So in many ways, you guys make a good partnership. Well, I should be very careful not to do anything she doesn't like. <laughs> That's great. Well, Bill, thank you for, for spending the time here uh, with us and i and i'm sure the people are going to be quite interested in your story uh maybe uh as you recall things uh, experiences in the past we can talk them over and maybe uh figure out how to make those available too if if uh you know if you're interested in doing that love to do it okay all right well thank you very much and uh, good luck we will we'll certainly stay in touch and uh Despite your health issues, I, I look forward to seeing you still active in the community as much as you can be. So good luck with that and uh, and enjoy. Thanks, Paul. Talk to you soon. Okay, you betcha.